Right now, if you said, hey, let's do a Crete tour, when? What's up, everybody, and welcome to Drinks with Johnny. I hope you guys are as excited as I am for today's guest. I'm going to sit down and get into it with Mark Tremonte of Creed, Alter Bridge, Tremonte the Band, and a very awesome project that I'm excited to uh, talk to him about, and that is uh, Mark Tremonte Sing Sinatra, a very cool album, and uh, I think there's a pretty good story behind it, I hope, um, and we're going to get into that and so much more. I am very, very excited for this episode, but I'm not so excited about this shirt. I don't know if we're going to get into it or not, but it uh, looks like Mark's ready to go, so let's start the show. Hey, how are you, Mark? Good. So? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's, uh, it's an early morning for me. I think you are probably the earliest guest I've had on this show so far. <laughs> oh, yeah? You ready to drink? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my coffee ready to go, man. I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> It's nine o'clock in the morning. Where are you at in the world right now? I'm in Orlando. Mm. Is that home base for you? Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Well, we're already rolling, so that you know we're uh, we're we're gonna get right into it here tonight, uh, today, this morning, whatever. See, it's too early. I don't even know what the fuck I'm supposed to say. Um, man, I'm excited to have you here on the show. I was just talking to uh, your bandmate and friend Miles Kennedy two days ago um, already about this uh, new record, Ponds and Kings, for Ultra Bridge coming out. But, I mean, you got so many other projects for us to talk about here today, too. Um, do you have, like, an ongoing, like, competition with Miles of who could have more uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> collaborations or, or, or just, you know, uh, thing, uh, jobs to do out there in the music world? Yeah, we just love it, man. We just love going after it. I think our, our biggest competition was when we had nine months to put this record together, putting in demos for the, uh, he put in two demos. I put in two demos. He put in three, I'd put in three. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, just, uh, we, we love to work, you know, love doing what we do. That's awesome, man. So, uh, w- one thing I wanted to go straight into was Mark Tremonti sings Sinatra. Uh, I was listening to this. Uh, I understand it was for some kind of a, L- the LP was kind of for charity of some kind. Is that, is that right? Can you tell me a little bit about this project and that charity? Yeah. So, um, so about three years ago, I became obsessed with singing like Frank Sinatra and I just um, went deep down the rabbit hole and uh, I practiced it just like I did when I was a kid practicing the guitar. I would study and, and um, I, over the, over a couple of years, I started feeling good about it, but I didn't know what the hell I was going to do with it. Uh, and then my daughter was diagnosed um, before she was born with Down syndrome. So oh. I had read all kinds of books uh, about Frank Sinatra's life and how he was such a philanthropist and he had raised over a billion dollars for charity. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to record a record of Frank Sinatra songs. And um, we partnered up with the National Down Syndrome Society to do the record. And we got the... Uh, the approvals from the Sinatra state to use Frank Sinatra's name and likeness, which was very hard to do because they've only done that for like Michael Buble and Tony Bennett. So it was really hard to get that done. And then on top of that, we partnered up with Frank Sinatra's touring band, the the surviving members of Frank Sinatra's band. So I got to go in the studio with, with the guys and record 14 tracks. And um, I'm, you know, for the, for the drinks with Johnny show here, I've got all my, uh, my oh, whoa, Sinatra, my Sinatra select Jack Daniels. Whoa! Uh, yeah, so this is. Uh, I'm are surrounded cool. by Sinatra stuff these days. But no, we've um, you know since the records come out, we've we've raised three quarters of a million dollars. So we're we're getting close to that million dollar mark, and uh, awesome. couldn't be happier about it. Wow, that's that. I mean, that's such a cool. So it's it's such a cool cause behind it. I mean, I was just listening to it, didn't even realize that there was a cause behind it. Uh, where can people go real quick? Just tell them where they could go if they if they want to listen to and donate uh, to the cause. There, we'll put a little description down here and below. Yeah, you just go to TremontiSingSinatra dot com. It should be all on there. And you know, on top of that, I started this uh, um this thing called Take a Chance for Charity. So. For guys like you, I would challenge you or anybody you know to do something that your fans would have no idea 
um, would, would not see coming in a million years, something completely different than, than rock, something, um, it could be good. It could be bad. It could be funny. It could be serious, whatever it is, whatever it is, is different. It's raising money for charity, undertake a chance for charity. And I, I've got a bunch of friends lined up to do projects, uh, as we speak. So hopefully it, hopefully it takes off. Oh, that's an awesome, that's a great idea. And I would love to be a part of it. I, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head what I would do for, <laughs> for anything there, but yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Just anything for charity, man. Uh, I would be a hundred percent on board. Um, let's get back into the actual recording that though, as you mentioned, I was going to ask mm-hmm. how, how the strings arrangements, the band was being recorded and stuff. You already mentioned that some of the guy, remaining guys, uh, uh, who are still alive from Sinatra's band. Um, where did you guys record that record this at? How was the, you know, who, who helped produce and mix this? Cause I know getting a live band in together in a room, uh, you know, can, can have its challenges sometimes. So how, how were you able to accomplish all that? Yeah, so we recorded up in Chicago, and um, it, there's a studio. There's a couple studios there that can that are suitable for the big band thing. And um, the one that we recorded at was um, right across from the old Caprini Green before that, you know after they had torn all that down in, in Chicago. There's uh, it's a great little studio. You'd never know it was there. We had um, 17 artists recording, so it was. Uh, Everybody but the saxophones recorded because we couldn't fit everybody. This was during COVID. Right. So we had the trumpets, the trombones, the drums, the bass, um, piano, and vocal going at one time. And then the saxophones had to come in afterwards. Um, but 15 out of 17 guys were original members of Sinatra's band. And then two guys were um, younger guys that kind of filled in. And um, actually, the bass player, most of the tracks uh, was Julian Smith, Mike Smith. Is, is Frank Sinatra's band leader. His son, who played with uh, Lady Gaga on tour, oh, came and, and, and cracked the bass. And he's he's just uh, top notch. And he's he's one of the guys that when we do shows, like I have a show in next next week. I have a show with the guys here in Orlando. And um, Mike Smith, the band leader, alto sax, flies in. Um, Carrie Deadman, who did a lot of Frank Sinatra's arranging. And in the later years, he plays trumpet. He he travels with us. Julian Smith on bass. Um, we we have uh, Dan McIntyre, uh, Frank, you know Frank Sinatra's touring guitar player, who was actually my manager's guitar teacher growing up. Wow! And that's how we made the introductions with those guys. Okay, I was gonna ask, how did you get? I mean, this is. I mean, you're naming you're naming all these names and and and, and where they came from. Obviously, uh, very extensive and legendary. There, I was going to ask how this all how this all uh, came to be. Yeah, he. Um, so when I called my manager and I said, you know what, I want to do something with this Frank Sinatra stuff I've been working on. I want to do this record for charity. So I want to start reaching out to some local musicians, see if I can fans, find some big band guys to team up with. He's like, no, man, we're gonna call the original guys my my teacher was dan mcintyre um so he scheduled a lunch with uh with dan and mike smith and uh they sat down there and listened to him they're like all right can your uh can your guy sing you know (laughs) and my uh my manager had never heard me sing that style of music he's like of course he can of course he he just went for it yeah the the age old yeah yeah, like was it yeah, like, like actors say that they could do all the things just so they get the part right? So, <laughs> oh yeah. So they're like, "All right, we're on board. Let's do uh, let's do a couple songs to see if this is going to work out." So um, I had said, "Let's do Luck Be a Lady," and the song is you. And the band's like, "Let's let's hold off the song is you. Let's do something a little more um, familiar." So we did "That's Life" and "Luck Be a Lady." Um, so imagine, imagine stepping in the studio with Frank Sinatra's guys for the very first time. And the very first song you pick is pretty much led by the singer. I'm not letting the, the band doesn't start that song. It pretty much starts with, they call you lady luck. Wow. Right. So I had to be in there setting the rhythm of the song. So Mike Smith draws me into this room full of all these legendary musicians. He's like, all right, sing the song. <laughs> you know, so that was my first go at singing with these guys and i got it all on video i got it on my phone oh that's great uh, so we have uh, we recorded all that that stuff up there and uh i'd love to see that sometime 
I got, I got, oh yeah, yeah that, absolutely. That, that 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 moment. I mean, I am a I'm a I'm a pretty big Sinatra fan. I'm pretty big uh, just uh, big band and jazz fan. I have a mm-hmm. I was talking to Miles about it actually the other day. We have a I have a pretty extensive uh, record collection. I uh, I got from my uh, late grandfather, and most of it's jazz. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of Sinatra in there. Um, one of the songs that I that I found uh, a little different, a little bit more of a deep cut, I guess. Uh, the wave yeah. that you that you guys chose to do, and uh, there's a great guitar solo in a jazzy guitar solo. Did you play that, or did you have one of the guys play that? No, I'm glad people wonder about that because it's it's killer guitar playing, but that wasn't yeah. me. Oh, that's, um, that's, that's that was interesting. I was like, okay, that's cool. Like he's kind of showing that he has like some of this jazz background too. So you you had well, you had one of the guys doing that, yeah. I stuck strictly to vocals on Strip, this record. The whole thing. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, that's Dan McIntyre on on Wave, and mm-hmm. uh, he does some great guitar work in my way as well. Yeah, um, which was an interesting take on my way as well. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad you brought that up. Like the starting out with just the vocal and guitar for for mm-hmm. what, what was it like an entire verse before the rest of the band comes in? I thought was a was a pretty yeah. nice touch. Yeah. So we sat. Um, that was the very last the very last song we we recorded so it was kind of a bittersweet moment i um i can hear it in the recording that this i was this is a life such a huge once in a lifetime kind of thing and um this is the last song we were recording so i was sad and you could kind of hear it in the uh in the song it was kind of a uh i wanted to keep going with it so anyways Mm. with that song i sat there with dan mcintyre and um I said, let's, you know, let's do this nylon string guitar thing. Um, let's not bring in the rhythm section until the third verse. Let's just keep adding layers as we go. So I sat there with him and he kept on comping, comping the song on guitar. I think he did it three or four different ways. And then I was like, wow, that way's really cool. You know, so it's so cool to see this, this jazz guitar player be able to play it so differently, so perfectly right out of the gate. Mm. And, uh, so that was the first and only song we did on the record that was improvised. You know, we just sat there. There were no charts. It was just, let's play the song. Let's have it happen in the moment. And uh, almost like a rock band would do. Yeah. That's amazing, man. Um, and I want to get back to the wave there uh, because it ties into, the I think, what you are talking about at the beginning. My question of where you found that you could sing this style of music and do it very well i will say like it sound i was like all right i'm gonna listen to this so let's see let's see what he's got you know kind of thing and right, yeah. nailed it i mean it sounds it sounds Thank phenomenal you. um in that style one of my one of the things that had me smiling and kind of i wanted to ask you about is that real low note in the wave that that, that you yeah, the, uh yeah <laughs> 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 That was that was a uh, that was an interesting interpretation going down there and doing that. Uh, what, what what brought that on? That's um, you know I went deep down the rabbit hole on Frank Sinatra's catalog and mm-hmm. I tried to find every interview and everybody talking about what what he's done and to this day even even years and years after I became obsessed with with uh, listening and learning everything I can about Frank Sinatra you still find new songs constantly because um, he recorded fifteen hundred songs about and. Yeah. Um, he was on all these live TV shows where he's saying so, you know, saying all night long. So you'll never get to the end of what he's he's done. So I remember reading this interview where somebody was talking about Frank Sinatra's vocal range and how he really loved to dig into his low his low registers. And um, they gave examples of a cottage for sale, which still a cottage for sale. It's not that low, right? Um, then what wave when i heard that i was like this and i heard um seriously sinatra serious xm seriously sinatra play that song a bunch mm. and uh every time every time i heard that song i'm like i can picture sean connery with a martini on the beach you know <laughs> 007 style Hell that yeah. song is about the hippest coolest song you know i i've heard so i wanted to do that song we got it into the studio and uh you know we're messing around with maybe taking it up a half step or doing this and that. I was, we're all like, no, we got to do it the way Frank did it. The the, the way that the, the instruments play in that key sounds way better than a half step up. Mm-hmm. So we did it. And um, I figured I'd record the record, put that song on it, but never do that song live. Cause that's that note so hard to hit. But the very first show we, we did I played that song and it, it worked great. I just got to eat the mic to good. 
because <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. you can't sing that that oh, that note too loud. So you just got to eat the mic on it. Wow, that's a great. Was there a specific mic you were using to um, in the studio when you're when you're doing this? Yeah, you know, I um, that's another quest I went on. I was so Frank Sinatra used U forty sevens for the most part in his Capitol Records years and all the mm -hmm. the most well known songs and. Um, so I tried to buy a U47 and I was on with, you know, Vintage King and everybody trying to find the best U47s. And I'd get all these warnings about you could buy a U47 and it could be terrible. These, these old capsules and whatnot could be shot. You could spend 20 grand on a microphone. And it could be, you got to hear it in person. And mm -hmm. there, I was just running out of time. So I, um, I found this company called Wonder Audio, W, W, U, N. And, um, they had a U47 that was rated really, really highly by everybody who, who had heard it. So I, I bought that. Um, Paul Reed Smith, I had played him um, Luck Be a Lady, and he got all excited about it. He's like, you know, the best sounding capsule in the world right now, the best, closest U47 capsule is by Heiserman uh, Audio. So I bought a Heiserman as well, a Heiserman U47. So then I got to Chicago, I got my Wonder Audio, my Heiserman, and then we rented a vintage U47 from the local um, uh, Chicago music exchange. I don't know if it was a music exchange or, or what, but uh, okay. we shot them all out, and everybody in the room was like, I like the uh, the Wonder and the Heiserman better than the, the original. So uh, Really? So when you listen to the record... Um, one of the songs that really sticks out as, as the Heiserman kind of tone is if you listen to um, You Make Me Feel So Young, mm -hmm. the crispness and the clarity of that, that's the Heiserman. The Wonder Audio is the bulk of the, of the record. Um, oh, okay. And, it's a, and I actually used that Wonder Audio U47 on, on the Pawns and Kings record for all my vocals. For all your vocals on the on the Alter Bridge new record too? Yeah. Oh, wow. And I didn't think, I didn't think that would work at all because um, I don't think that type of mic is meant for a pushed aggressive vocal, but it worked right. great. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Before we get into that new record, because obviously I want to go there too. I want to, yeah. there's a couple more things I want to get, uh, get through on this. Uh, uh, Mark Tremonte does a uh, Sinatra project. You have, you said that you played some shows you get, you, I, I, I think I misunderstood you at the beginning. Um, are you playing uh, in Orlando? You're playing with the Sinatra band? Is that is, yeah right? Okay, cool. So, and how many shows have you guys done live, and how often are you planning on doing that? Is that is it kind of like whenever you guys feel like it, and you send out an email like, "Hey, are you guys free? You want to come down and do this?" Or, uh -huh. or how are you guys uh, figuring out the shows? Um, so the shows are are tough to put together because it's a seventeen piece band, and the mm -hmm. um, you know when it's a rock band, you throw four guys on stage and some amps and a drum set, and you're you're fine. But with this, it's you know, you don't want to talk the business side of music because it kind of sours it. But it's expensive to put on one of these shows, so we got to well, we, make we sure. We can talk that, about it here. We go into all <laughs> the weeds that you that you're comfortable with going. That's where we'll go. Yeah, yeah. So we did the first show um, at my uh, in Orlando at um, at this little theater in town that we had people come from all over the world to see it, and um, it uh, it was great. I mean, it was it was such a it's such a rush playing in front of these, this band and this, this quality of musicians. And it reminded me of being back in the studio. And, um, so I wanted to, there was no rehearsals for this stuff. You don't get to rehearse. You just throw this, the music on a stand and you go for it. So mm -hmm. I had never sang this album in its entirety live before. And I didn't know which songs were going to go well live or not. So my, my friend, John Earhart, um, has this great big backyard and he's, and he's worked in production his whole life and set up this awesome PA and set up this stage in his backyard so we could bring in the band a day early and just do a rehearsal run through. And just by doing that rehearsal run through, I'm like, all right, we're going to do Wave Live. We're going to do every, every one of these songs live. So awesome. we did that night. We just invited friends over for like a, a charitable dinner where we sold some stuff to raise money. And, um, and then we did the show the next night. Um, which was the official first show and everybody got dressed up in suits. And, you know, you see, you see all these fans that you that. see at your meet and greets around the world wearing black, you know, shirts with skulls on them. Now they're of wearing course. ties and, you know, which was great. Um, everybody enjoyed getting dressed up except for one of, you know, one of my buds who, uh, 
who's a fan came up. He's like, you'll never see me dressed like this again. <laughs> <laughs> but he um, still did it for the, for the cause. So, uh, Oh yeah. Good on you, bro. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, so my next show is next week actually. And, um, I'm lucky enough that locally we have the Dr. Phillips performing arts center and they had this world renowned audio audiologist or whatever it is that dials in these theaters and it's got ranked the number one best sounding room in the world. Oh shit. So they just opened it up this, uh, I think six months ago. And, um, one of the gentlemen who donated a bunch of money to get it, to get part of this theater built is retiring and asked if we would play his retirement party. So we're playing, this show with some crazy heavy hitters like the like the mayor you know and all these people are coming out to this show and it's cool about the sinatra thing is you know people ask when i go to the ch these charity events and you have like a country band plan or you have yeah. a big band plan or something they're like why don't you get your bands to play these these events I'm like well <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't fit it doesn't fit no <laughs> it doesn't fit at all so um for the first time I got a band that, that can do all these events. So, um, that's cool. You know. man. I didn't think about it that way. That, that makes perfect sense. Cause you're right. Like when those, well, I don't know if you guys have ever done any Creed or Alter Bridge or even your, uh, Tremonti stuff. Um, have you ever done any of the conventions or anything like that? That's like one of those more sterile environments with, uh, with yeah. any of those bands back in the Creed days, we did, uh, ah, we did some weird stuff. We did, uh, I remember one show in particular. It was when Blockbuster Video was huge. Hell um, yes, Blockbuster Video throwback. I love it. That's how old. That's how old I am. So <laughs> Blockbuster. No, no, that's, uh, that's how classic you are. That's how classic you are, Mark. <laughs> oh man, no, it's. Uh, I loved Blockbuster when it was when it was Hell thriving. Yeah. Man, I was just but, I was just next to the one that's it's now a massage envy by me. Yeah, and I was like, and I was just like I was picking up some food next there, and I was like. I looked over. I was like, "Man, I used to I used to go in there a couple times a week and pick oh, out. Yeah, it, was, it was fun to walk around and, and find your video." Have you? We'll get back. <laughs> I'm totally digressing right now. <laughs> but if, if, uh, uh, have you seen the last blockbuster um, uh, documentary, documentary on Netflix? No, I want to. I want to watch it because that was a huge part of. Uh, like I said, like when me and my wife first got together, every single night we'd go to Blockbuster and get a movie. Right. I mean, that's what you did. Yeah. It was. And it was yeah. fun walking around and you might split up for a second and go into the different genres, come back w with a couple of different, you know, options and okay. you got to figure it out, you know, <laughs> get to know the manager, let them know when that new release that's, that's always sold out. It's back in stock. Right. All right. Tell me when Top Guns comes back in. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're aging yourself. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But anyways, yeah, so uh, so uh, I think we went off on a tangent about Blockbuster there. But yeah, this, no. this was back when you were – so in that era, Creed is going to yeah. do one of these uh, more sterile – Like a corporate. A corporate. A like, corporate event, Like corporate right? kind of gigs, you yeah. know. So Blockbuster was putting on this event. And um, they had all their blockbuster people from around the country come, and they had all the money in the world to hire all the current bands. So it was, um, look at this lineup. You had Leonard Skinner headlining, which was killer. Um, you had uh, Backstreet Boys. Wow. Um, and you had I Creed. I see a lot of crossover from those two, at least. I mean, I can see the no. Creed Skinner. I, ca I can't see too much of uh, Backstreet Boys Skinner. I can even yeah, see so, yeah, yeah, the Backstreet Boys Skinner fan base. I don't think overlaps too much. I don't know. And it was a weird thing. You know, imagine you're stepping off. Or I can't remember if we were before or after Backstreet Boys, but uh, imagine you got your, your guitars on and whatnot, and then you walk past these guys in their track suits, you know, doing, <laughs> doing their thing. And everybody was friendly and nice enough, and we had a, we had a great time. And uh, But, yeah, those we also did something that was really cool back in the day called the um, – the blind date. I don't know if you're familiar with those. I mm -hmm. think it was like the Miller genuine draft blind date. And they would, um, they would take a, oh, a big band. Did they, they, they used to run commercials on TV for those, right? Yeah. I mean, those okay. were huge. They, they would take a band that played arenas and they would, they would pretty much pay them what they would normally make on a normal gig but they would throw you in a house of blues or something or a small venue. So I do remember these. I do remember seeing that. I've, I've never mm -hmm. been to anyone or anything like that, but I do remember seeing uh, the advertisements mm -hmm. for those. They're super cool. Cause imagine you're, you're, you go into this venue and there's a big drape in front of the, in front of the stage 
And then all of a sudden, Stone Temple Pilot starts playing. Like, oh, wow. You know, you don't know. It could have been you too. It could have been the Rolling Stones. It could have been right. whoever. But we did one of those. That was a lot of fun. See, um, that sounds more fun. I mean, back to like the, the more corporate thing is like like we were talking about you don't have you go in with a with a creed or or an altar bridge and it's people are 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 relaxing they're sitting down and you're like we've in avenge we did one and i don't think we'll ever do one again but it was a friend we were in the yeah is in the gaming world we did nightmare in front of all these people literally in uh in like what do you call those the the recliners they literally have like <laughs> these nice recliners and they're just watching us and we're like it was our first and only time we ever done anything like mm -hmm. that. You don't have that energy that you get from oh, being, yeah. being on a rock stage. So can you, can you uh, empathize with that at all? With, 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 oh, it's, that stuff's the worst. You know, yeah. it's, um, you know, sometimes you just, it's part of the business. You have to do those kind of things every now and then, you know, it's uh, right. um, like doing, um, TV performances or whatever else that might be uncomfortable and not quite your thing, but you got to do them to, to promote the band. Um, those are my least favorite things to do, but they're sometimes the most beneficial. Have you guys, um, did you guys ever do uh, Saturday night live? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I've that never, awesome. never done that. Um, can you, I mean, I, I wasn't expecting to ask you about that, but like, what, what, what's that? I'm a huge Saturday Night Live fan. I record it every Saturday. These days I don't stay up late enough, five-year-old kid, uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, uh, I have to record it and watch it with my wife later on. But I've always loved the performances over the years. I think that that's one of those mm -hmm. things where, like we're talking about, maybe not our, your favorite vibe um, mm -hmm. of performance, but definitely an iconic, cool thing to do. What was that like yeah. for you guys? That was, that was really cool. We, um, when we got there, um, Billy Bob Thornton was the host. Oh shit. So he kind of came in and came and introduced himself. And, uh, what movie was he promoting? There's usually <sighs> the host. Is I think this, this, right? this was after sling blade. Okay. Um, but, uh, so they said, your guys are going to do, um, a song. And then if we have time, you can do another song. And I remember, I forget what, what single we were on that we had played, but, it wasn't half as fun as I think we were going to play bullets at the end of the song, which was one of our heaviest songs. And um, I just remember watching through the show and going, please let us have enough time because that's such a fun song to play. And on TV, it's, you know, um, it would be a lot of fun. And, and finally I said, all right, you guys are back on, get up there. So we got to do two songs. So you did bullets um, and what else did you do? Well, um, I'm trying to figure out what era this was. I can't remember what the first song would have been. Um, to be honest with you, I'd have to look it back up. Well, we don't have to look it up. That's what people on YouTube can just let us know right down below. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and then I remember one of the coolest parts was at the end of the show, they bring everybody on stage and they're playing the goodbye music and all the actors and comedians come up there. The classic hug. And, uh, the classic hugs. I remember. Oh, yeah. Jimmy Fallon was one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. You know, got to, right got on, to spend man. some time just talking with him for a minute. And then... Uh, Will Ferrell was on the show because he was so. This still is one all like cast. early two thousands cast. Is that late late nineties yeah. cast? Is that what we're looking at? So imagine that, man. J Jimmy Fallon and Will Ferrell both on there. Um, Rad. I pretty much told Will Ferrell, "You're the funniest man alive," and he was. He, hey, thank, thanks. You know. <laughs> like, what is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yo, wait! I was expecting a funny comment back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. Beat it, kid. <laughs> That's incredible, man. I, I, I love hearing that. Um, uh, real quick, uh, not to go too much on this uh, Sinatra stuff, but I do want to ask. Uh, uh, I'll talk about Sinatra all, all week long. If let's you do want. it. That's, that's, Perfect. Because yeah. that's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan as well. But you did mention that uh, with the charity and your daughter uh, being diagnosed with Down syndrome. And I know you got, a, you got therapy that you're going to with her. How old is she now? Mm -hmm. She's 18 months. 18 months. Okay. And mm -hmm. is, is she your only child or? She's my third. I've got, third. I've got uh, a 17 year old, a 13 year old, two boys. And now my, my first daughter. Okay. And okay. we actually fly to New York tomorrow for the buddy walk up in uh, New York, which is uh, the big net, the down syndrome society's uh, big fundraiser up in Manhattan. Oh, wow. I, okay. That's, that's a great thing. I didn't, I didn't, you're raising awareness to at least one guy right now because I don't yeah. know about, about any of that stuff. That's that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, and there's also a gala in um, in March that in up in New York that we're actually going to perform at with the Sinatra guys. So the that's Sinatra another guys. thing. Okay, I, cool, cool. I couldn't get to, I couldn't get to bring go. Alfred Briggs. No, nah, I mean maybe, maybe a couple of songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Certainly not a not too many off of the new record though. Ponds and Kings yeah. definitely is a is a heavier record. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we were talking to Miles about it. I I wanted to ask you uh, more about it too. When I listen to this record, what I what uh, the great songs, great songwriting, vocals are awesome. Every uh, you know uh, what a lot of what you expect from you guys. Uh, but in this era right now where a lot of the bands in the, in the rock world seem to be kind of put through the conveyor belt of sound these days mm-hmm. in a lot of respects, I, it was a breath of fresh air to kind of hear some more natural tones, specifically from like the drums and stuff. And I was wondering if you mm-hmm. uh, had any insight to, you know, working with your guys' producer on that, if that was really a conscious effort between the band or was that just his style? Uh, we specifically said on this record that we wanted a record that was way more stripped down. We wanted it to sound like a rock band in the studio, not not a modern programmed, you know, where there's a violin pad under everything and there's a right. piano key boosting everything. Because um, all that stuff works for certain songs, but in the end, there's only so many frequencies and so much space on a record. And when you can strip all that away, the guitars can breathe so much more and the drums can... Um, breathe that much more and and we specifically say on the drums please don't sample every you know don't sample the drums let them be what they 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 well, need you to guys be. recorded right you know, we go into the mixer and oh, yeah. saying hey oh yeah let's throw a sample on the snare on the kick uh oh, you might as well throw some samples on the toms too like let's yeah. this is completely negate what we did for three weeks in, in a studio <laughs> just getting yeah. the drum tones yeah no every <laughs> every snare hit should sound unique you know every kick drum should sound unique if you say you say you record one great take that has you know a lot of key moments but there's a weird rim shot in there okay replace that with another snare hit but other than that keep it keep it legit not not all you know any kid can get on garage band and create some right. excellent sounding thing that just sounds like a computer we don't want that we want it to sound like like the band so we stripped everything back production wise and um you know, I think the last record we did, we, you know, um, were inspired by kind of the synth wave thing where you hear um, the old school synths and the cool vibe from the 80s thing. And, and um, we just did that once and now we're back doing our original things, trip everything away, is just make it the band. Well, it sounds great. There's great songs. Uh, uh, I Love Sin After Sin was one that popped Thanks. out to me on the record. Uh, uh, Kevin sent me the uh, stuff uh about a month ago so i was mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure before these uh people at home of hearing the whole mm-hmm. thing not just the four songs you guys have released to, uh, at this point and then the uh, i always forget the name of the last song the last song uh ponds and kings, ponds and kings the, the mm-hmm. title track right why do yeah. i keep forgetting that one uh any at any rate another great song and uh i was surprised that the last song on the record would be one that's released before the actual release date for the for the mm-hmm. album um and I know that Miles said that he brought that one in. It wasn't even sure it was going to make the record. And then mm-hmm. you guys alter bridgeified it and uh, it yeah. came to life. Um, it's a longer song. Last song, of the, you know, that's usually considered a spot for your deep tracks, your, your progressive song. And it's one of the, one of the singles before the release. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, I think, I think that song just kind of is a good snapshot of what this record's all about. Um, and it's, I, I hate being, I don't want to be the band that ever considers before writing an album about singles. We need a single. We need a single. That's, mm-hmm. uh, I think I gave up on that about 10 years ago because we would, <laughs> you know, you have in the back of your mind, we need a song that's under four minutes long that, that hits the chorus quick and it, you know, it's the radio format thing. But then it doesn't do anything. It, it, if you go down that these road, days, it, it doesn't do anything anyway. Let's be honest. Let's be real. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> you know, back when we thought that way, you'd do it and you'd, you'd, you'd edit your song down for radio. And then all of a sudden you got a number 16 single at Active Rock. And it's like, I, I just, and it's not worth it. I just right. want to completely do what it is that we do and not have to think about any kind of conformity. And, and um, that song like I said, it, 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 it's kind of the vibe of the record. I think this, a lot of people have said, oh, this is, your, this is one of your heavier records or your heaviest record. I think it's more of a dense record. There's a lot going on. There's, um, um, 
There's a lot of information on this record. I remember when I gave the record to my brother and I and it had 10 tracks. He's like, dude, you can't put out 10 track records. Your fans wait three years between albums. You need more songs. And then when he heard it, he's like, all right, 10 tracks is fine. These, these songs are, <laughs> there's a lot of information here. 10 so, tracks um, after three years. You guys... Your fans are nice. It's uh, six years and, uh, you know, however many tracks we decide to release next year. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. Well, one of these days we got to do a Avenged Alter Bridge tour. Hit, hit I would Europe. love that, man. I would absolutely love that after getting yep. to know you guys a little bit now. Um, I don't know how we haven't crossed paths more um, on yeah. some of those festivals or if we have. You know how it could be. I mean, we're on at different times and blah, 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 different yeah. stages or whatever. So we haven't actually uh, properly met before today. So, um Mm -hmm. but yeah i would absolutely love that um in some facet i think that'd be that'd be very cool absolutely man um speaking on uh on touring and stuff you guys have a, have announced for alter bridge with the release on october 14th everybody um you guys got some uh some tours coming up uh some pretty big ones in starting in january i think i saw right we start in november november in, uh, 1st and then okay gotcha yeah yeah, so we go to um, last week in October, we fly to Europe for rehearsals, and then uh, we go from November 1st through November 12th, and then I stay in London. We're playing the O2 in London with Alter Bridge, and then we're, I'm going to stay there for two days off and then do a Sinatra show at, at, at the O2 at the Indigo Theater. Oh, shit, that's uh, awesome. Ah, that's so, got to be so cool to have those two projects running. Uh you know, and be able to do those two different things at the same time while you're out there. Just as, as a, yeah. as a, as a fellow musician and someone like, I'm just like, that would be really cool. Just be able to stay in one place and do two completely different things. That's, that's really oh, cool. Yeah. So as I'm warming up for Alter Bridge, I'll be fly me, you know, singing, singing Sinatra. <laughs> you gonna throw that stage. in? You guys gonna throw that in in the Alter Bridge stuff a little bit, you know? You know what they, um, on the last Germani tour, um, I was such a fool to, I went through the, almost the entire tour without mentioning it to the crowd. And finally, I'm like, this is the, the perfect audience to tell about the project. So I would say, you know, to get serious for a minute, I did this record, raising money for charity, check it out, please. And this and that. And when I'd step off stage, our front of the house engineer would play one of the songs from the record and then people would, would hear it and, and go okay. support it. Um, but as far as performing it, I don't want to water it down. I want it to be legit. Um, if anything, I would, you know Tanner, my my bass player in Tremonti, he he does gigs constantly. He does some Sinatra stuff every now and then. He does more like uh, um, different versions of it. But I'd sit down with an acoustic guitar and do that, but not rocked out. It's right. not that's not what that's not. Oh, what definitely, it is. and I wasn't even suggesting that. I was just like mm -hmm. give given the, the the fan base. I mean, even as you said it. Uh, uh, when you guys were walking off stage, that that parting gift there is is a good mm -hmm. way of doing it too. But it's like in between yeah. songs, just you know, hit a couple of those notes for them. Let let them know what's up. Oh yeah, <laughs> wear the wear the Sinatra shirt. Yeah, <laughs> I, man, I I can't tell you how much fun I have doing that stuff. So it's got to uh, be so, it's got to be so liberating to do that, man. I'm 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 envious of that. That that's such a cool project. I, I really I really really excited for you on that one. You know what's fun on it too is you can um like i went i went on vacation with my wife and uh we were down and uh down at this this beach bar and this guy was playing guitar and, and th one of my friends goes up there and tells him to call me up there and we did you know we did my way and uh new york new york you know at this wow. little beach little beach bar so it's it's cool because you can i love karaoke and some sinatra too that's uh hell yeah i mean well like you said you, you'd been studying him for years before you even really put this project together like how long how long is years like if, if you like how many years are we talking here and when did you realize man i could actually pull this off or was it kind of like oh i think i could pull this off so that's why i'm gonna try or was it like, I'm just going to see, you know, you know what I mean? There's a chicken or the egg yeah. basically on, on that. So, so I guess years and years ago, I, at Christmas parties, you know, the karaoke mic would come out. I'm talking, I don't know, 10 years ago, I'd sing and be like, you know, this feels good on my voice. It feels like my, a natural voice. And I'd sing Bing Crosby or Dean Martin or Sinatra, or whatever it was. And awesome. it just felt like, yeah, this is nice. And then years later, I came across uh, 
I, I went on YouTube and I just couldn't fall asleep and I came across the song is you as a, I think it was recorded in 43 or 44. It was a young Frank Sinatra, almost shy playing in this auditorium and uh, absolutely killed it. You know, he's like the, the shy kid next door getting on stage. And as soon as he sings, it's just, you're like, that's why he became so famous. It was just, his voice was incredible. And I, I was like, you know what? I want to sing like that. I want to practice this just like as a guitar player, you hear something like, I remember watching the um, crossroads movie and seeing oh, yeah. Ralph Macchio and Steve Vai going at it. I'm like, I want to learn that. So I'd sit down and playing all that stuff. And it's just like hearing Sinatra sing. I'm like, all right, I got to sit down. There's way more to it than just memorizing the melody and singing back the lyrics. You, and right. it's, it's a matter of like really picking apart every breath he takes and every vibrato he makes and every pronunciation and every little tiny bit of it. And um, so I was like, all right, I'm going to dive in like I dived in on the guitar. And uh, about two years into that uh, is when I was like, you know what? I feel good about this. I've, I've um, you know, you work on it, you get better every day at it. And uh, at that point, I didn't know what I was going to do. And then that's when the diagnosis came in and I was like, all right, that's, that's the reason I was obsessed. You know, there's sometimes there's reasons for, for everything. And uh, right. it's, the stars just aligned way too much for, uh, it was just, uh, it was all kind of a, I don't want to be that guy, but it just seemed like a meant to be kind of scenario. No, you can be that guy. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different beliefs on that, obviously, but mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think it's necessarily a religious thing for me, but it, I do believe that that, things just kind of fall in place the way that they were supposed to for a lot mm -hmm. of different reasons, or it may just be because that's the way, that's just the way the universe just keeps going around. You know what I mean? And like yeah, it, it, the trickle down is where it happens here and it's always going to happen there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, something as simple as that. And I know other people have their own beliefs in that as well, but yes, I mean, a lot of times I yeah. think if we really look at it, even the fact that, uh, you know, the two of us are in successful projects and successful bands and be able to do the things that we, that we do. We're incredibly mm -hmm. fortunate and lucky, you know, like we worked hard. Absolutely. absolutely you know, uh, uh, <laughs> what is it? L luck is the residue of the ready or whatever it may be, you know, and you work on that, but there's an, an incredible amount of luck involved in that as well. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right place, right time, right worth ethic, work ethic. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we just started today, I don't know if we would have the same success. It's a different world. So, right. So I, I'm sorry, but I, I wanted to point out to people listening and watching at home there too, that it is a very fortunate thing and things do happen for a reason and try not to get yourself down about everything. Um, but uh, uh, I think we were talking more about how that was serendipitous or, or, or for the moment when you right. heard that your uh, daughter was diagnosed with uh, Down syndrome, right? Yeah. And then, you know, um, when I mentioned, all right, I want to do this project because of this, my manager goes, yeah, my guitar teacher played with Frank Sinatra. That's one of those, like, uh, that's another, that's just another sign. I got to do this. Right. Right. Um, and then, you know, this was definitely a mountain to climb to get this record done was a lot of work. It was, um, so my manager's next duty was, all right, get the band guys together. Now, Mike Smith was like, all right, you got us. We're going to record with you, but you got to get permission from the family to do this. And that's, that's next to impossible. Mm -hmm. So my manager calls up, you know, the gentleman who runs the Sinatra estate and uh, immediately like, no, you can't do it. You can't. Nope. Well, we get a hundred calls a week of people wanting to do Frank Sinatra projects. Nope. So we, they keep it all very, they protect it understandably. Um, right you know, one of the most famous entertainers of all time, you got to keep that legacy airtight. So. I was surprised. I do know a little bit about that in the sense that we were doing, we were mixing Hail to the King, I believe it was, or I'm sorry, we we're doing the strings for Hail to the King at, in Capitol, mm -hmm. in the Capitol uh, B building. Across the hall was, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. It was an older gentleman that was working on a Sinatra, one of the last things Sinatra ever sang. Uh, Hank? in capital I, it might have been it might have been um i think it's hank hank Sinicola. yes that sounds familiar yeah. yeah right so he was over in the in the in the city next to us and we were just kind of walking by kind of hey what's going on over here like why does that sound like sinatra and what, what's going on over there 
and uh, he invited us in to listen to the project he was listening or he was working on. And uh, I'm not sure if it ever got released, but I, he told us this is literally the last thing that Sinatra ever sang. And uh, mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do is, you know, clean it up, polish it up and get it to release. But then we got to take it to mm-hmm. the family and see if we even get that approval as well. So I have no idea if it was released, but even someone who has the masters and is in the Capitol building was, was mm-hmm. uh, finding a little bit of difficulty on that. Oh, yeah. You know, and you were, you were in such a historic room that if you went down to the basement there, they have the, uh, um, the telly mic that Frank Sinatra sang on. Mm-hmm. Right. So um, Charles Pignon, who who runs runs their business side of things, said if you um, if you want to record out at Capitol Records, I can I can probably make that happen. I can get you to sing on Frank's mic, put you on his stool, give you a bottle of Jack Daniels, and set you all up for that session. And uh, it was during COVID, so we couldn't get out there. But uh, next next next, time next LP next LP that you yes have. there you go. Next time I'm in I'm in LA, I'm definitely going to go see that microphone. Well, when you do, hit me up because I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tag along. I think oh, yeah. I don't I don't remember if we made it down to the basement or not. Now now that I think about it, we've we've done a we've done strings and arrangements there for several of our records uh, in that uh, in that Capital B buildings. Uh, room, and I don't know so. if it's a basement or a storage room or what, but it's definitely a definitely got some some history for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as you said, there's that building in general. Like it's got oh yeah so much history. Um, I digress a little bit though. I just keep keep going into that there. But uh, uh, yeah. it's it's uh, I think you heard it's it's actually my uh, tenth anniversary, and I think those were the flowers that were being delivered. If you oh wow, that, that congrats! Thing thank you, thank you. Um, uh, and I heard you. Are those your dogs in the background? Yes, they're. They bark at the landscapers. They don't like the landscapers. <laughs> I don't blame them. Like, uh, you know, every, every time I'm trying to do this podcast and landscapers are around, I'm like, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to put the gates on that afterward, you know, have to oh, yeah. <laughs> clean that up and post. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> but, um, I wanted to, uh, ask you a little bit about, uh, Creed cause I had uh, Shane told who has the lead singer syndrome podcast, um, on the show earlier this year. And he had mm-hmm. Scott on, and I guess they he had asked the question, and it was kind of entertaining the ideas of of you guys kind of coming back together to do some shows or something like that. Is there any truth to that, or have, am I really late on that news as well? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, it's it's always something that's floated around. You know, it's um, for us, it just it's just a matter of being the right opportunity and the right time because mm-hmm. it's right now. If you said, "Hey, let's do a Creed tour." when i've got an ultra bridge tour starting in november all the way through next year right uh, so it just has to be a window that makes sense for everybody because we all work way too hard on these records to to, to put a four-month gap in the middle of the promotion of it you know right. and um you know on a creed tour it could be a it could be a 30 day short run or whatnot and um uh, but still you know people don't understand people are like hey why don't you have creed do this one-off um, at this thing it's like you can't you can't have a band not play for 13 years and then do a show without a week's rehearsal and then a whole team putting together the production and all the team there's a lot that goes into it so well that's why you get all short, the comments on social media come to my country come to my do all this <laughs> like, like sure oh, yeah, let's yeah. just drop everything and we'll just you know yeah like throw my throw my bass on my back and just fly out there and that's how it that that's how it gets done <laughs> yeah, you know, in this day and age, you know, that's that's the one thing where I've always been against the digital modeling amplifiers and all that stuff. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're doing fly dates and you're going to, you know, Jakarta or something, you know, that's the only time I'll use like a Kemper or um, an Axe FX or something. And that's that's made touring easier because you could bring, a, um, you know, your little USB port with all your settings on it, and rent the local Kempers, plug it in and. You know, some I just wouldn't play I, somebody else's guitars. Yeah, you still got to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that's true. That's true. And you and you know, it's not like you're. I imagine uh, I haven't seen your rig, but I imagine it's a vault with several guitars in it. It's not just like, oh, I got this one guitar yes. and I use it for everything. On the, no, for two hour our, set. <laughs> one of my biggest one of my biggest problems as a songwriter is I use alternate tunings a lot just to mm-hmm. keep things interesting and. Um, 
for each alternate tuning, you got to have a backup guitar. So absolutely, um, you know, one guitar could back up three guitars if you're lucky, if it's pretty similar. But um, I usually take about eight guitars on tour for myself, and Miles okay. takes about about the same. Okay, so that, it's, that's it's, reasonable. It's, that seems reasonable. I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, how many bases do I have? I have at least eight. I don't. I actually don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's more than that. But I got five string setups too. So there's, yeah. yeah, so. It's about it's a, it's about eight. That that's not it's reasonable. It's reasonable, people. Yeah, you got it. You got to get from one song to the other. You don't want to sit up there and put a mute and tune before everybody. That's not. No, you know, that, it's cool if you're like a jam band or a blues band, just kind of chilling. But when you're doing the you know the big straight I'm too, up rock, I'm also like too lazy for that. I would just be like, eh, it's close enough. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and in the moment, you got your adrenaline going, and you definitely wouldn't tune it. No, correctly. it wouldn't sound perfect. But anyways, yeah. uh, I, I do like the uh, uh, the Axe effects and stuff like that for that reason. I mean, I haven't, I don't know about you guys, but I haven't had a, a cabinet on stage in years um, mm-hmm. just because it's, even with the, the heads that I was using, the Galen Kruger or the Dark Glass, mm-hmm. it, it, I didn't need it on the stage. Like, we're, we have in-ears, so I'm listening to everything yeah. on the in-ears and then just trusting, not even trusting, but talking to this, the front of house and going, Hey, what, what's going to make it easiest and best sounding for you out here? Cause I've got ears yeah. and it doesn't matter. Like whatever is going to make it sound great out there. Do you still use cabs on, on stage when you can and stuff or I, I use a cab, but now I, um, I was the o- oldest school guy in the band for sure. I was the last one to in ears, the last one to, to do, try anything different from just super loud. I, my rig used to be massive on stage. But now I use one head, one cabinet. The cabinet is, um, I have another ISO box with a 112 in it that, that carries the load. So I can turn the amp down as low as I want. The front of the house gets the direct sim- signal. And because um, I don't want to be the only guy on stage that you hear. I don't want to hear just drums and a loud guitar. Because a lot of times you're playing um, a theater where first couple hundred people just hear your guitar and nothing else you know so i so i've got an onion ears have the one little iso box to to carry the load so the front of the house can have that nice even mix of everything um but if i want to take my in-ear out i have the cabinet up there in case i need it okay okay so that that makes sense you know everyone's got a everyone has their own way of getting it getting it done on stage that's why i I was curious on that and then uh getting back to i think we were talking about uh potential creed stuff and why you know you're, you're simply explaining what uh i already know but a lot of people might might not understand is that you need time for this stuff it's not like you're just gonna yeah. throw the band together after you know x amount of years however long it's been since you guys have played together and just go do these one-offs right yeah yeah like yesterday i started putting together a set list for alter bridge um to present to the guys like hey i think these are the songs we have to play and this is a second tier of songs we can keep changing every night Mm-hmm. but relearning some of these songs um it's like starting over you know when i go play with tremani i know those songs backwards and forwards right now now i have to forget those and go into the ultra bridge mode and relearn all that stuff i you know when i do uh guitar clinics on tour and people are like hey play this teach me this solo i'm like i gotta relearn that solo. i don't play it live right now so right. <laughs> i can't i have at this point, I've recorded seventeen albums, and I can't re- I can't remember all that stuff. Shit, you know, there's there's no way. Yeah, that's a that's a lot of records. Yeah, and yeah, especially when you're talking guitar solos, specific guitar solos. Maybe I might be able to remember a chord change or something like that. But you're gonna yeah. ask me to remember all the licks in the guitar solo. Like that's that shit's not gonna happen no. on the fly. <laughs> no, I only know it if I'm playing it that night. I know it. If, yeah. Otherwise, I gotta I gotta relearn it. Yeah, I, I'm the yeah same way. Like when we're when we're putting a set list together, like I like to do a little of the rehearsing myself uh, at the studio, relearning the songs, and then we'll get together for like a week or so before that. Mm-hmm. This time around, it's probably going to be longer than that because we haven't played a show in six years now. So <laughs> it's wow. going to be a little while. But is that right? Yeah, I think so. I th- someone could correct me, I'm sure, but I think it's been something like six years. I think we got off the road in 2018. Oh, so it'd be four years five years come in 2023 gotcha that's too long man too long (laughs) you're telling me but the the good the good part is though i have a five-year-old son over that time Mm -hmm. i've been able to just be home with him so the silver lining of of you know the horror horrible things that happened you know with the with the pandemic and stuff and not Mm -hmm. downplaying that for those that were extremely affected luckily i wasn't 
firsthand affected by anything necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just kind of took it as a silver lining of like, all right, we, we all have young families. Let's, yeah. let, let, let's, let's get to know our children a little bit better before we hit the road again. You know, same with me, man. I had my, my one year old daughter that I got to spend pretty much her whole life with. I remember when, when I went on the first tour, uh, the first couple of weeks were around home. So I got to hover around Orlando. And then when we left for three weeks, I hadn't seen her in three weeks and I came home and she stranger dangered me. I went to hold her oh. and she's like, who is this guy? That was horrible. Oh, that doesn't, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. That, that, you know, that doesn't feel good. That's, that's rough. Yeah. But the next day she was great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, um, if you don't mind me asking, what kind of therapy do, um, do you have with her? I, I, I'm not familiar with the, yeah. with what that would be. So she goes to therapy every day of the week. She has um, speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, physical therapy. She does talk tools, um, you know, because we really want to focus on her communication because a lot of children with Down syndrome have a um, tough time um, pronunciating things. So she has all these different, this person flies in from Atlanta, um, I think once a month to kind of reassess how she's doing. And then we go to this other therapist that does the day-to-day stuff. And, uh, you know, she's, I think children with, with Down syndrome are like six months behind kids without Down syndrome when it comes to crawling and, and walking and, and everything else. She's, uh, eight, like I said, she's 18 months. She's crawling and she's, I mean, she's the cutest thing in the world. She, she'll communicate with you, but, um, you know, she's just, we try to stay ahead of it as much as we can. And we're, Right now, you know, like I said, we've raised all this money for the National Down Syndrome Society, and we're trying to figure out um, where some of that money is going to go. And we're um, there's a lot of exciting, you know, I spoke with uh, Dr. Raj at Advent Health here in Orlando, and um, I told him our story. Like, my daughter had to have open-heart surgery. Um, she had to get um, a few other procedures done. Um, but she's a tough kid. She gets right through it. But anyways... Um, I had spoken to Dr. Raj about a family with a child with Down syndrome. It's not something to be afraid of, but it's a lot of responsibility. And if you don't stay on top of things, your, your child could kind of fall behind. And um, mm-hmm. there's, there needs to be programs set up where you can go to one place and have all your therapies in, in house. Cause um, that's we're not lucky. The case. That's not the case in most places. No. In most cases. Right. So we have to drive sometimes an hour in one direction 45 minutes in another direction to go to all these therapies. Oh, and if you're a nine to five mother uh, or father, it's, it's hard to stay on top of that. So when all I right. spoke to Dr. Raj, he had did a, he had wanted a follow up meeting with me and my wife and gave us a tour of his hospital and said, we'd like, you've inspired me to set up a down syndrome center through, through Advent health. There isn't one here. And we want to do that because of, of, of um, you know, we were inspired by what you guys have, have been through and what, you know, what you guys can bring to the table with what you think families need. So it'd be great to have, you know, this, this, or like I said, this early Frank Sinatra obsession turn into something that develops, you know, a, a, a center for kids with Down syndrome to have all their therapies in house, all their, all their medical, all their doctors. You know, they said when a kid comes in, you spend 15 minutes with a doctor and you're on to the next patient. But here you'd spend an hour, hour and a half. You'd see every therapist, you'd see every doctor, you'd make sure you're on top of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, they'd know all the ins and outs of what a child with Down syndrome needs. And, and uh, it wouldn't be a guessing game. It'd be like the easy guide to how to raise a child with Down syndrome. I think that would be, you know, obviously that's a great cause and, and it's, it's awesome that you're able to help out with that. Cause that does sound like something that would be something very helpful right and uh mm-hmm. i know uh i have friends uh, i have a friend that has a, a rare uh, really rare disease not not down syndrome it's, it's something different causes seizures and stuff and then mm-hmm. another one that um has uh, a daughter with autism um and i i bring that up just to just to ask the question of like i know that there's uh where they lie on the spectrums of these different diseases or different uh, uh ab- abnormalities uh abnormal I can't even say the word, uh, (laughs) abnormalities. Uh, uh, where is your daughter on that? And if you, for people who don't know, like if you stay on those things that you're talking about and get it on one building and other, other parents who have children, uh, with down syndrome and stuff, uh, Mm -hmm. with these therapies, they can, they can hopefully 
get to a, a, a better quality of life um, later yeah. on, correct? Yeah. So, you know, people have explained to me, you know, because I'm learning new stuff every day. And um, people like peop- the, the different spectrum of, of pe- folks with Down syndrome uh, it changes just as much as, as people without Down syndrome. You have people that are way different in any regard health-wise, um, uh, Down syndrome or not. But as far as the difference therapies can make, it's huge. You know, if mm-hmm. you, if, um, you know, say you didn't have insurance and you're just afraid to put your child in any program because you just can't afford it. You know, when I spoke to Dr. Raj, he's like, I said, what happens if you have a child that can't afford treatment? He's like, we won't turn anybody away, you know, because this is all uh, um, driven driven by, by donations and whatnot. We will, we'll handle all the kids. But if you have a child that doesn't do these therapies, they're going to fall. They're going to they're going to fall behind in in in, in ways. And you don't want to, you know, when you have a child, you have your five year old son. Imagine him not getting all all of the things that he was um, reaching all, all all his full potential. You yeah. know, uh, you want to do everything you can, and and um, it definitely makes a big difference. We've seen the difference firsthand of of um, the things we've done along the way. You see it. You see it every week. Yeah, and I, I think I think uh, uh, part of part of that is, I guess, kind of a blessing is it, you get to celebrate those smaller moments too, right? Like uh, something mm-hmm. that uh, I, I spoke to somebody else who uh, who was talking about their child with epilepsy, and it's like that that help that uh, impede some of their progress as well. And um, but you get to every little thing is an accomplishment is like a big celebration like like oh yeah even bigger you know what i mean like uh i i don't know how how else to describe it but it's just it you take the time to celebrate what other people take for granted and it's uh or oh, granted yeah. you know and not granted like the stone granted um, <laughs> <laughs> and it and it um and it truly puts things into perspective right Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, she, she becomes, she became the center of all of our world. You know, her, her older brothers absolutely adore her. Every, every time she says a new word, like just yesterday, I was, my son had, was sitting around when I was sitting there with my daughter. I'm like, all right, say, uh, say this, say that, do this, do that. Mm-hmm. And he was just amazed about all the new things she was doing. You know, I'm like, just simple things like, uh, say bow wow wow and she'd go wow 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 you know and my son's like what she can do that you know so every little thing <laughs> is such like you said such a huge achievement and um you know like recently she had to get um she had a lung tie and a and a, a tongue tie and a lip tie so the dentist had to laser her her lip and then under her tongue okay uh, because her she couldn't pronounce she, her tongue couldn't move around as much so since she got that done She's saying all kinds of new things. She's doing all kinds of things. She does oh, this. Fantastic. When she's not happy, she sounds like a little Chewbacca now because she's just this thing with her tongue. <laughs> kind of thing that she, <laughs> That's she wasn't so awesome. doing. <laughs> yeah, she wasn't doing that before. But right. uh, but yeah, every little achievement is is amazing, and um, it also helps that we had a child so far different than our older kids that our older kids can enjoy the baby and be part. They're almost like uncles now. Right. Yeah. That that's a big gap in age there. Right. Yeah. Man. Um, well, I'm going to let you go. I know you got to, I know you want to spend time getting to the therapy there real quick, but I want to get back to the ultra bridge tour. I think we, uh, we digress like we always do here on the show, but we were talking about coming up in November, starting in Europe. Um, and then, uh, walk me through the, the rest of the, you said you got like a year, year and a half already figured out for ultra bridge, right? Yeah, we go, um, we go out in the States in January, February, I believe. And then, uh, take a three week break, do another four or five week run of the States. Then after that, I believe we're going to go to Europe for, I don't know if it's been announced, but we always try to hit all the big festivals in Europe. And then, um, promoters have told my manager that, um, they want to maybe do another third U S run of this tour. Um, I want to specifically get to, uh, Greece, um, on this, this record cycle. I want to get to Israel. Rad. Have you uh, been to either of those places? I've been to Greece with Tremani and we were, we were playing with Iron Maiden and it was right off the bat. First time the crowd's seen the band, first time we've been there, it was one of the best shows we've ever done. I mean, it's like 65,000 people just. And the Maiden fans were, were that receptive. That's, 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 that's it a was good thing. That's incredible. Well, we did a tour, we did a tour um, supporting Maiden with Tremani over in Europe and that was, uh, 
yeah, it was one of those things where like, I hope this goes good because if it doesn't, it's, it's going to be stadiums and arenas full of angry people. But it went, I think as long as you play a, a tight, energetic show, um, the maiden fans will, will dig it. Don't, yeah. don't pull out. Don't pull out the ballads. No, 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 no. Uh, no. We, we did a maiden tour in Europe uh, years ago. And uh, I asked the question because it took took about three solid shows before we started to win that crowd over. Because uh, especially in mm-hmm. Europe, I think you get a test that at least mm-hmm. the first four or five rows are the same. A lot of the same faces you'll see for that entire yeah. summer or that entire European trip, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, you know, it was it was it was definitely a cool tour to have. And I remember when we, um, when I went to the dressing room, there was a big bucket of Iron Maiden beers. And it was said to our friends in Tremonti, welcome to the tour. We're glad to have you and all that. And took sweet a picture dudes. of that. For, sweet dudes, man. Love those. Guys. Oh yeah, absolutely. You got a picture of that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Oh no. Yeah. I took a picture of that for the archives. I actually have, um, I'm a pinball guy. So I've got two Iron Maiden pinball machines upstairs. Oh, right on, right on. Are you, yeah. You're a pinball guy, like you like to collect the machines, or you're a pinball guy, like I am a pinball wizard. I, you know, get out. No, I'm. Uh, I collect machines, and I, I, you know, I don't. I don't think I'm a great pinball player, but I'll. I'll beat all my friends, you know, because I because <laughs> I have I have pinball machines. But when I when I hang out with, you know, when I go up to the Stern Factory or the Jersey Jack Factory, and I play, you know, these world champions, they absolutely crush you, you yeah. know. Well, you haven't spent the time like you did with guitar and learning how to sing like Sinatra as you have That's on right. the pinball machine yet. We'll, 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 we'll get yes, there. Later. Yes, <laughs> but, but speaking of the pinball thing, I'm, uh, I've got two secret projects in the pinball world that are coming out in the next year or two that I'm a part of uh, that I'm really excited about. So my, my, my pinball love and my music love are coming together so they're, they're collab- and can you talk about it now or you want to hold that hold that off until it's a little closer to release no i've i you have to sign ndas to do to work on these okay. projects because because pinball they don't they only announce like right before a pinball machine comes out and they like to Was keep it, it just like us with our records you don't want to leak right. the songs early right, right yeah right. okay totally makes sense i understand i understand mm-hmm. um yeah, so cool. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, for now, um, love to stay in touch with you, man, and uh, yeah. continue our, our conversations. There is a lot more we could get into, obviously. Um, you know, we're just kind of scratching the surface for this first chat. And yeah. Uh, But, um, yeah, go uh, have a great rest of your day. Hope the therapy goes well, man. It's been a pleasure for sure. getting to know you and uh, talk a little bit of music with you, man. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right, man. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Cheers, of course. Bye-bye. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Drinks with Johnny. Thanks to Mark for being on the show. And thanks for not bringing up this shirt, by the way, Mark. I don't know if you did that on purpose, but I had to wear this shirt on a bet that I made with Matt Money Smith a couple weeks ago, whatever it was. This is the first episode I'm recording. I had to wear a Chargers shirt. I'm actually a Raiders fan. I made sure to wear my Raiders hat as well so that uh, whatever, I don't have to hear all about it. I'm going to go burn this shirt now. And uh, we'll see you next time. Cheers.